day. Because I get to sit and listen and get fed from a man that I know that has some wisdom. This is the Andrew who will be bringing out words that you are excited about hearing what God has put on his heart. So let's go ahead and give the Lord a hand clap. privileged to be here this morning and I'm very thankful because this is one of the few times I have left to speak with you guys before we leave for Africa and you know this month I have the opportunity of opening up the month of worship and if you don't know me my name is Andrew Sutton uh, but if you don't know me very well you have to understand that I have always been one that goes against the flow to my detriment I will go against the flow, regardless of whether or not it's right or not. My goal is never to go with the grain of things. I just don't like it. I don't like people telling me what to do. I don't like being in a position where, where I'm not in control of things. And oftentimes we're all that way, but me more so. And my characteristic is more of one that that likes to find things that are different. And this concept of worship, man, this microphone is driving me nuts. <laughs> took me a half an hour to get it on this morning, and now it's not even staying up there. But I have the, I've never been one that has, has been able to accept criticism very well. And, but I've always been one that has always thought about, some, about ways to do things a little differently. And this morning I have the opportunity to think about worship in a different light. And I know that we as ministers will have the opportunity this month to share with you different ways that we'll be able to worship. On the how, the why, why we should worship, when we should worship, and the how. And I know our pastors are going to bring about that message and be effective in it. But this morning I was challenging myself, what difference can I make this morning when I'm speaking about worship? Because I want to talk about worship in a different light. I'm about ready to get rid of this thing. I want to talk about worship in a different light because I want to talk about who this God is that we worship. We can talk about worship all day long and how we should worship and when we should worship. But if we don't understand who this God is that we worship, then what's the point? Amen. Now, I believe our society wants to find something to worship evident in the way we go to ball games in drones of people I also know that we want to worship our jobs sometimes and the activities that we do our hobbies and even our families in society in our society that it's that way and now all these things aren't that bad in and of themselves but what is bad is when we begin to love and invest in those things more than we love and invest in the kingdom of God that's when it becomes bad and in the church, we've become just as guilty. You know, I think this is because we have an unhealthy view of who God is. This God that we're supposed to worship. And I don't expect you to understand all of God's attributes in the next 30 minutes that we're talking. But I do believe that I can give you a few of his attributes. And you can continue the process on your own and grow your understanding of who God is. So as a, I want you to open your Bibles to John 4. And this is our verse, our focus verse for this month. And as you're opening, I'm going to pray. Father, I thank you for this morning, and I thank you that you brought us together. I thank you that you are God that is in control of everything. Father, I pray that we would understand your characteristics just a little bit more this morning and understand who this God is that we worship. You and you alone. In Jesus' precious name. So our focus verse for this month is John 4, 21 through 24. And I'm not going to take anybody else's thunder. I'm just going to read it. So if you look at verse 21, it says, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. 
God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. You see, Jesus is speaking to a Samaritan woman here, and the conversation is extremely important. But the two aspects that I want to bring up about what Jesus says here is first, in verse 22, he says, you worship what you do not know. You see, Jesus was talking to a Samaritan woman, and she was worshiping anything that was easy for her to worship. Does that make sense? She didn't understand what she was supposed to worship because she didn't have the understanding of who God was. So she understood what to worship was the things that she knew was easy to worship. You see, we see Jesus and we, he even has a relationship with us because we accept his gift. But I believe that we can't move forward because we're either afraid of what we'll find in this God that we worship or we're too lazy to continue looking for it. You see, we create, we're, we're, we are as beings created to worship. And some of us worship whatever comes easy to us, just like this Samaritan woman. So we be, because of this, we become, because of our fear and our laziness, we become comfortable with the things that we worship. That's why on Sunday afternoon, here in just a little bit, you'll see 30,000 fans down in Nashville watching the NFL game. And you see maybe 50 of us sitting here, in here on Sunday morning. Because sports are easy to worship, but learning the depths of God's characteristics, they're frightening. Because God is so deep and so wide that we don't quite, we can't quite wrap our minds around it. We find something else to worship instead of this God that is we're supposed to be worshiping. And he is so frightening because we don't know exactly what we might find when we start looking for it. The truth is, God is God. And we're supposed to worship Him, not because of what we understand about Him, but because of who He is, period. The second thing Jesus says in verse 24 is, those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. And I want to talk about the truth part. Jesus says that we are supposed to worship Him in truth. Unfortunately, our truth has been skewed by political correctness. And we no longer worship God because we believe in the truth of society over the truth of what God, who God's character is. And so we worship what society expects us to instead of worshiping the true God. You know how I can say that? Because we see people standing up for their faith and we criticize them for standing up for their faith. But when, did, when did Christ ever bow his opinions to those that were, in political, were, were politically ruling over him in his day? He never did to the point of his death. He never did. And he went completely against the flow. And we must know who this God is that we worship and worship him according to the truth of what the scripture says that he is. So I want to show you this morning three narratives in the Old Testament. That's just the introduction, by the way. I want to show you three <laughs> narratives in the Old Testament that show you specific attributes of who God's character is. And this will only help you begin the process of learning these attributes on your own. I'm just showing them to you. I want you to see them, and I want you to grab a hold of them. And one of them will jump out to you and say, hey, I want to read this more and study this more. So I want to show you this. So open your Bibles to Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. I know that's kind of odd. But Ezekiel... In this narrative, he is a prophet. In this, he is a prophet to the kingdom of Israel. And Ezekiel is a prophet during the time of captivity in Babylon. And there are some people, there are some of the captives that are in Babylon and some that are still in Jerusalem. And there's about 10,000 that's with Ezekiel in Babylon. And Ezekiel is seeing a vision that God has given him. And there are three characteristics that jump out to me about God's character as he's speaking to Ezekiel. And I want to read this to you. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out of the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and, was, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by the, all of them. Or, it caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, like any good Christian would answer, Oh, Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these dry bones and say to them, 
O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord to, the dry, to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sin you on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and, I was, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, a sudden rattling. The bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinew and flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Also he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breathe the breath of, on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breathe and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, Our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from the graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O, o my people, and, put, and brought you up from the graves, I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, am the, I, I the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. I know that's long, and I know you probably lost it some in there. That's okay. But verses 7, these three characteristics, verse 7 and 8 says that God has the ability to make all things new. I want you to think about that. The first characteristic I want you to think about is God has the ability to make all things new. In verse 7 and 8 it says, So I prophesied. And then in verse 8 it says, Indeed, as I looked, the sinew and flesh came upon them. You see, it's interesting to me that God commanded Ezekiel to prophesy to these bones and say, Look, bones, you, you need to have flesh and blood and breath. But what happens in this first prophecy? Ezekiel prophesied exactly what God told him to do, but what happened? There were only skin and flesh and sinew, but there was no breath. Side note here, it's interesting to me that Ezekiel was prophesying exactly what God told him to do. And he only placed the tissue together. God only placed the tissue together. But even in the midst of us obeying God, God still knows what's best for us. See, God is still God even in the midst of our obedience even though it may not happen like we expect it to. See, this God that you worship can take the deadest, most corrupt, if deadest is a word, most corrupt, most sinful creature and make it new. I wish we understood that attribute of God. I wish I did at times. Unfortunately, we believe there are some things about God that He cannot do. Kind of place Him in our box. Expect Him to do only what we think He can do. And I have to tell you that God can take the most dry, dead, dusty, destitute person and make them new. It doesn't matter where you come from or what you fit in. The problem is we criticize and we judge and we make assumptions that we're not qualified to make about the God that we love and the God that we serve because we're not qualified to make those assumptions. God not only makes his, his other people new that we see around us, but the problem is, is we can't believe that he can make us new because we know who we are. We also believe that God's grace sometimes doesn't apply to us like it applies to other people. That we've become so far gone that God cannot reach us. Truth is, this God has the power to give dry bones flesh. The same God right here has the power to make you new. He has the power to raise Christ from the dead. He has the power to make you new. Yes, that's right. And he has the power to bring you out of the depths of sin that you yes, may be addicted to. Yes, Think about this. Praise him, for he can make all things new. Yes. The second attribute that I see is God's ability to provide the gift of life. In verses 9 and 10, what does he do? He prophesies to the to the flesh and the skin that has no life. But what does he do? He prophesies and God gives them life. God not only helps us realize that he can make us new, that he can provide a new skin for us, but he also helps us understand that he can give us the gift of life. What kind of life are you talking about? 
I'm talking about the life that changes everything. That life that when Christ comes into us and changes our life, that's the breath of life that he's talking about. One that is only found in the grace and the mercy of Christ. God has the ability to breathe the breath of life into all that come to him. All that come to him. That's what his word says. He has the ability to help us understand our need and the ability to change our life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This God that we worship has given you. If you've accepted that gift that Jesus has for you, if you've accepted it, he's given you a new life. That new breath of life. When Ezekiel said, breathe, that new breath of life comes in you. He has shown you that he has the ability to bring you from death to life, but he also never leaves you at that point. You see, that fresh new life that he gives you is not just the salvation, but it's also the life that you live from this point on. Yes. He gives you a new purpose and new goals. And do you see, do you understand a little of what this God can do in your life? Praise him for the breath of life that he's breathed in you. The third thing that I see about God's character is that he has the ability to restore. Oh, how often we forget about this characteristic of God. We get so lost in our own sin and our own nature that we forget that God can restore us. The children of Israel made several bad choices, if I can say several. But what does God say here? They're in captivity in Babylon because of their choices that they made. See, he is willing to restore his people to their homes. That's what he says in verses 12 through 14. Why is he willing to do that for us, for them? Is it something they ever did for the restoration to occur? No, by no means. It was never anything that they did. And we are never to read... To, we are never to understand that God restores us because of something we ever did. God restores because he wants us to understand who he is and who this God is that we are to worship, period. He doesn't restore because we do something, ever. He restores because he's God. Look at verse 13. It says, then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves. Oh, my people, and brought you up from your graves. We worship God. We worship a God that can restore marriages, provide victory over addictions, allow forgiveness, restore health, and most importantly, restore the relationship that we have with him. If you think this morning you have done too much to not have God's attention, I say no. There's nothing you can do to get God's attention because he already loves you. It's never a five-step program or a habit that you can break or even the good nature that you think you might have. It's always the goodness of God that restores. Right. Right. We need to worship and praise Him because He is good. The second narrative I want to talk about is Elijah, the king of Syria. And if you'll turn over to 2 Kings 6, 14-18, You'll find, and it should be up on your screen, but if you want to turn, it's, I like to read the Bible, so it's there. Second Kings 6. And here is Elijah, and he's hanging around with some prophet trainees. Unfortunately, he had a trainee named Gehazi that made some bad choices. And this guy, he, he made so many bad choices that we assume that it led to his death. So now Elijah is trying to train up some new guys. And because Elijah had this particular guy for such a long time, he's opened his school up again. And here we find this servant learning from Elijah, following Elijah around. And in the middle of chapter 6, we find that the king of Syria is trying to attack Israel. And the king of Syria is making all these battle plans. And what happens is the king of Israel already knows about these battle plans. And so the king of Syria automatically makes an assumption that it's somebody in his own group that's telling the king of Israel what's going on. But in verse 12, one of the king's servants says, None, my lord, O king, but Elijah, the prophet, 
who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. Well, this makes the king extremely upset, as you can tell, and he sets out to find and kill Elijah. And this is where we pick up the story. Let's look at 2 Kings 6, 14 through 18. And it says, Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God rose early, arose early and went out, there was, a, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots and of fire all around Elijah. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elijah prayed to the Lord and said, Strike these people, I pray, with blindness. blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elijah. I see two things here about God's characteristics that we need to grab a hold of. First thing, in verse 16 and 17, God has the ability to open our eyes. What an awesome thought that is. That God can allow us to see the truth of our circumstances and the truth of other people's circumstances around us. How often we get overwhelmed with our jobs and our struggles and our failures and our lack of faith and give up. But let me tell you something. This God that we worship has the power to open your eyes to see the truth of what's going on in your life. This servant was ready to give up, realizing that the two of them had no chance against an army of thousands. But God opened his eyes to see the army ready to fight in his stead. And this army is the same army that's here to defend and protect and instill confidence in his people today. You need to understand that God is the same God yesterday as he is today. He's the same God then as he is here. And he can open your eyes and he can help you see the power to help you have victory over the things that you're, you're in every day. The, the, in the midst of defeat, he'll help you see victory. And praise God for his willingness to always open our eyes. How often we forget that he has the power to control that. The second thing I see in Elijah and in God's character in this, in this narrative is that God has the ability to shut eyes. Just as important as it is for God to open our eyes to see the truth of what's going on around us, God has the ability to shut the eyes of those around us that doesn't need to see what's going on. See, Elijah was praying that God would close the eyes of the Syrian army so they would not recognize him. And God did. And Elijah, if you read on in the rest of it, Elijah leads the army of Syria directly into the midst of Israel's army without them ever noticing it. Do you realize that God is on your side? Have you ever been in a situation where everything looked grim to you, and yet God stepped in? Yeah. You see, just like he has the ability to help you understand what you need to see, he has the ability to shut eyes of people that he doesn't want to see. And I can tell you that because I was in Mexico one time. Back and forth. We actually we were actually staying in Texas and traveling back and forth across the border. To Mexico. And every morning we would get up and load a school bus full of rice and beans. I'm not talking little bags of rice. I'm talking 100 pound bags of rice and beans and Bibles. And every morning we would pray that God would close the eyes of the patrol officer that got onto the bus and saw what, what was there. And every morning after we prayed, we'd load up, we'd head on to go across the border. The patrol officer would walk up and down the aisles, get off, and let us pass. You know why it's so important? Because you cannot take things like that across the border or you'll be arrested. And it was interesting to me that because of law, we weren't allowed to do this, but every day we would come and we would pray over it and we would ask God to close his eyes. And when we came to the border crossing, never once did he stop us. And every time he had the opportunity to walk up and down those aisles, he had to see those bags of rice. And I tell you this because God can shut the eyes of those people 
that, help need, that don't need to see because he wants you to continue the ministry that you're doing. Amen. And he has the power to do that. God wants us to see how he controls everything, not just the things that we see, but the things that other people see. All of us on that bus could have been arrested, but God has the power to blind the world so that his purpose can be fulfilled. Isn't that a cool thought? Yeah. Yeah. Praise God that nothing is outside of his control. Praise him. Finally, I want to talk about Isaiah's vision. Chapter 6 of Isaiah. See, Isaiah was a prophet, just like Ezekiel to Israel. But Isaiah's vision was a little different. Isaiah's vision was his call on his life. I want you to listen to what happens here in chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, High and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, and two he covered his, his face, two he covered his feet, and two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The one, then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand the live coal which he had taken from the tongue, with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who show, and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. <clears throat> there, are, there are much more than three, but there are three characteristics that jump out to me here. The first characteristic is that God is awesome. <laughs> God, the creator of heaven and earth, he is the creator of heaven and earth. Look around you, see what... He created just for you to see. Can you not see how awesome this creator is? I love having the opportunity to go to different places and see things that have been created by God. And I had the opportunity just recently to go to Arizona. And I was kind of expecting it to be flat and ugly and kind of dreary. And we, we flew in that night. It was late that night. We got up the next morning and we got the van to drive around. And my wife and I... I was driving, and she was sitting next to me. We both had our cameras out taking pictures. I didn't expect to see them, but what I saw was incredible. You, you're surrounded in a valley by mountains all the way around you, and it was just really cool to see, and I'd never been in that place before, and I never knew how beautiful Arizona was, but we also had the opportunity to go check out the Grand Canyon, and let me tell you, the word grand does not describe it if you've ever seen it. The absolute incredible vastness of this canyon is it's just amazing. It's absolutely God's awesomeness at work. And we have no excuse not to praise Him because of what we see on a daily basis. We must be willing to see how awesome He is, not only in creation, but also in our own lives. You see, we have the opportunity. Isaiah saw this vision of the Lord in the temple, and God was clothed and, and just in his robe filled the entire vastness of the temple. And there were beings around him that all they did was one thing. The one thing they were required to do was to praise him, to worship him. And they were there to worship the awesome creator that he was, that he is. And you may say that that seems selfish, and I say nothing I've ever seen or heard on this earth is as awesome as the creator that created it. The second thing that I see in these scriptures is that God is holy. Verse 3. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And I'm very disappointed in the way churches have portrayed God's holiness today. This concept of being holy has been thrown out and replaced with this concept of God being our friend. 
And I realize that the Bible teaches that God is our friend as well. But God has to be holy first before he can be our friend. And he cannot, God cannot be in the presence of unholiness because he is ultimately holy. So you ask, how can he then be my friend if he is holy? And I say it's only because of Christ's Christ grace, Jesus' right. grace, and his love for us. Because God's holiness and his love for us, he gave the ultimate sacrifice for us. Even Moses wanted to see God's face, but he couldn't. Why? Because if, if he did, God's holiness would completely destroy the unholiness in Moses. Completely destroy Moses himself. Because his sheer nature is holiness. God is holy. This means his actions, his nature, his nature, his omniscience, his perfection, his justice, his nurture, his will and his love are always perfect. How often we try to think that we understand God. <laughs> oh, there's no understanding God. There's only worshiping him because of his holiness, just like his cre creation, these creatures did. They covered their face, their feet, and they just worshiped because he is holy. Praise God, for he is holy. The last thing I see about God's character in this, in this verse is that God's ability to call. Verse 8. It says, I also I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. Did you know that one of the, God's greatest characteristics and abilities is to take a sinful create, a creature like you and like me and call us to do his work? One of his greatest abilities is to do that. And why would he? This God who can do everything himself, why would he choose to call us and use us? And the only thing I can come up with is that he loves us that much. And God has a call on each one of our lives. He wants to use us despite of who we think we are. He has enough power with one word to purify every bad thought, every sinful action, and every addictive spirit, regardless of what it is. He's calling us right now to do it. How often we get so hung up on what we have to do. It's only what God can do for us. He wants you to reach the people around you, and he's willing to do it all by his grace. We far too often get so hung up on what we've done, and you know these verses don't teach that. That Isaiah came to the point to where he realized that he was in the presence of a holy God, and the only thing that he could be purified is through humility. And the point that we choose humility over pride is the point that God says, all right, I'm ready to meet you. Let's go. Yeah. And what happens? This is interesting to me. That by one touch, one touch from the altar, that God has the ability to make all things new. To bring the dead to life as he did in those dry bones. By one touch, God has the ability to give true life. That he can breathe the breath of life into you so that you can live from here on. Yeah. By one touch, yeah. God has the ability to restore you. Amen. To take us back to the land that we don't deserve. Yeah. By one touch, God can open and shut the eyes of people as he pleases. He makes people see and not see so ministry can continue on going. Yeah. God can open it. Or by one touch, God reveals his holy and awesome nature as described by Isaiah. And finally, by one touch. God calls you to a life of worship. This is not an understanding of worship, but a lifestyle of worship. And it starts at salvation and it continues to our death. We are to worship him because he is worthy. As the singers come up, I want to know that we're all sitting here this morning wondering what our, the call is on our life that God's calling us to. Oftentimes we wonder about that and we're confused because oftentimes the world gets, gets it confusing for us. And there are many of you that sit here 
and has never accepted the gift of Christ that is, is there and ready for you. And we would love to explain that gift to you. And others sitting here wondering where you are supposed to worship or where you're supposed to fulfill the call in your life. And the truth is, is that you fit right where God placed you to fit. You just have to trust him to know where to go. You see, as a follower of Christ, we worship God through everything we do, not because of anything we've done, but because of who he is. And he is worthy of your worship. One.